of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my strength and my redeemer. So they were all there. Jesus had requested that a few of them go and find a particular owner of a house and let them know that they would be ready to partake of the meal together. The owner knew that they would be coming, and the table had been set. And so they were there, and they were sharing a meal together. There was something special about that meal and about that particular night. And I can imagine seeing Jesus staring off into the bread that was on the plate. And while he was looking at it, took of it. And without saying much, began to bless that moment and broke it. I can imagine how the disciples who had their own little conversations right then and there may have stopped for a moment, waiting in expectation of what their rabbi, their teacher might say. He looks at the bread and looks at them and says, this is my body given for you. And as he gave them of the bread, each one, I imagine that they were probably trying to make sense of that. And we're going to take communion here in just a moment. (laughs) Uh, I know we're anxious. But he's looking at that, and as they ponder, what does he mean by this is my body? He takes the cup. And after having poured it, he shares with them, this is the new covenant in my blood. Take, drink of it, for it is for the remission of sins for many. And it is there with those words and in that moment that the table had been set with a great meaning and significance that leads even up for us to this day. You see, that's what we call the Lord's Supper. Sometimes we use other language for it. We may call it communion. Um, Others in the Christian tradition call it the Eucharist, which means thanksgiving or gratitude. And it is a practice that we do as we gather together as the church, a community of believers, in the same way that Jesus did with his disciples that night. Now, Baptists traditionally consider communion one of two ordinances that that mark one's place and willing participation in the body of Christ. Other Christian traditions call it a, a sacrament, a means of imparting a divine grace to the participants. Now, there are many ways that Christians talk about this sacred ritual. And there are many ways that theologians and priests and pastors have tried to communicate the significance of communion and what it means in the moment when we participate with it together. And as you might expect, there is no shortage of disagreement among Christians as to what the practice is and what it means to us. As a little bit of a history lesson, history tells us in the 1500s, When the great German reformer, Martin Luther, some of us may have heard of Martin Luther, said that what happens in that moment is is what he would call a, a very real presence of Jesus found in the bread and cup. Luther was convinced that 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 Jesus was in and under and through the elements of communion, the bread and the, the, and the juice together in a miraculous way that defies our understanding. Now, in opposition, the great Swiss reformer Ulrich Zwingli 
considered communion to be an emblem, a, a symbol of Jesus' presence. And those two disagreed, and so did their followers. And their disagreement was so contentious, a, a great rift was there that was so much that on their last meeting they left angry and not reconciled. The irony there that they left each other's presence divided and disconnected, the exact opposite of what communion is meant to do. And if I could take a poll today of myself and those of us who are here and those of us who are worshiping with us online, and if I were to ask you the question, what in your life keeps you from sitting at the table of Jesus with sinner and saint and as sinner and saint, what would your response be? Although Christian traditions have varied in their views and understanding of what takes place in communion, we can agree that there is something mysteriously beautiful about the sacred ritual even if we do not all agree on exactly what happens in it. And perhaps it is to our advantage that we do not know, that we appear into the sacred act of communion in all of its mystery and in all of its beauty and are captivated by what happens in the moment, but even more so by what happens because of the moment. Because Jesus shared of his life with his disciples, even unto death, choosing to wash their feet rather than to run from the cross, to share a meal with them rather than to gather a sword, that the disciples become more than a motley crew of misfits at odds with each other and at odds with the cross, but in sharing communion, they were being shaped and formed into a community that modeled the life of Jesus. They partook of the bread and cup, which Jesus called his body and blood, and he shared his life, and they became a community functioning under the unity and guidance of the Spirit. You see, communion does not divide as Luther and Zwingli did but it brings together. It does not create barriers, but it breaks barriers down. It reminds us that we are one in our humanity and we are one in the spirit. And that brings us to our passage today. Paul uses the same metaphor of the body that Jesus uses to remind each member of the church at Corinth of their significance and their place at the table. Having been baptized into Christ's spirit, they were no longer to live as individuals only, but as ones whose lives were now integrated. Lives that were being renewed and lives that were having a new life coming out of it through the power of the spirit. They were to exist in the world as an integrated community of the same body, renewed by the same spirit, that all would bear lives being formed by God through community. And the body metaphor that Paul uses with an emphasis on unity and diversity, it contradicted the way of Roman society and the way that society was often viewed, where those who had a degree of power or money or prominence were given special privileges and favors while those who had less prominence, the members of society who were not esteemed as highly were often hidden and ignored. Paul says, not so with the body of Christ. Paul contrasts the functioning of Roman society built on status and wealth and prominence with the unity found in the body of Christ. For the body of Christ, every member is important. And the function of every member is deemed important and worthy of honor. This unity is not uniformity. It's not that we are to be the same. No, it celebrates the diversity 
and yet we are in unity together. Just as each part of the body is unique and beautiful and of a particular function, so each person in the Christ community of believers is unique and beautiful and beneficial to the community. And the diversity, the various expressions of gifts and abilities and talents, all of it in all of its variety, enhances the body. And Paul reminds us that each person, each member, has a significant place in the community. No member is insignificant. No person is without purpose. No one is without value. No person is without honor. All have place in the body, all are valued in the body, all contribute in the body, and all have equal importance in the body. And I don't know about you, but that's good news, to know that you are not insignificant. You matter to God, and you matter to the body of Christ. Every member matters. Yes, the smallest of members matter. If you don't believe me, just ask a professional football player who's ever had turf toe. Now, some of you all may not know what turf toe is, but let me tell you something. Professional football players are some of the best athletes on the face of the planet. The ones who make it to the pros are the top 1% of the top 1% of all of those who play the sport. They can run faster than most of us here. <laughs> they can lift more than most of us here. And their IQ, the ability to play the game, is more than most of us couch coaches are willing to admit. But if you ever want to see a professional football player be brought to their knees, it's not from having another football player slam into them because that happens time and time again. But let them have turf toe. It's the injury that occurs when on the big toe, the little joint on the big toe, when you're running on astroturf and it puts enough pressure and strain on that joint where, where it begins to become uncomfortable and even downright painful. And so the once seemingly invincible football player can be brought to their knees and have to sit out for games at a time. You see, even the smallest joint can bring one of the biggest athletes down to their knees just from a little bit of hurt. And I bring that up because the truth of the matter is that no member, regardless of perceived significance, whether great or small, is able to live and exist in our community in a way that they are thriving if they are hurting because it will affect the body. And so the one who is hurting, it affects the body. The ones who are struggling, it affects the body. The ones who are not functioning at their best, it affects the body. And our response as the body is not to ignore the hurting. It's not to look past the ones that are missing. It's not to look past the ones that are struggling. But our job as the body is to engage with compassion and love and support, even as we would our own body. You see, we are responsible for each other. We are the body of Christ. You alone are not the body, but we are the body. And so how we show up with each other and how we show up for each other speaks of the connectedness of our community. Even more so, it speaks to the work of the Spirit of God that brings unity and beauty out of a diverse community. And we witness this in the world and especially in contrast to the world that often thrives off of disunity, contentions, and tribalism. Every member is significant. And without community, our spiritual formation cannot be
complete. You know, one of the meditations that we have in our worship guide this morning simply says, there is no such thing as an independent Christian. (laughs) I like that a lot. And that's because the work of transformation occurs when we see our true selves in light of a community that is being transformed by those being transformed. So to forgive and be forgiven, to love and be loved, to have compassion and be compassionate, to sin and repent, to give and receive, that's a fruit of the Spirit. Working among people who have committed to each other the way that Jesus committed his life to his disciples. This is Christ's body. And our lives are being formed when we show up with all of ourselves, with all of who we are, regularly with one another. And showing up, has that not been without its challenges this year? Virtual has become the default for almost everything in our lives. Matter of fact, I was thinking about the Nelson Atkins Museum. Uh, Kristen and I love to travel and see museums, and, and the Nelson Atkins has a virtual tour where they have gone through painstaking um, uh, detail in photographing the different um, pieces of art and uh, sculptures and things like that. They've, they've done their best to, to take a picture of, of each image, having it color calibrated to make it look just like it's right in front of you. They even got the light shining down on it in just the right way as if it was there uh, being displayed in the museum. And they've got all of that happening. Well, Well, that's how I saw some of what was happening at the Nelson Atkins until uh, several months ago, Chris and I actually had a chance to visit in person. We finally lined up a babysitter for Langston, and we made our way there for the very first time. And we got a chance to witness the beautiful pieces of work and the collections in person. We we witnessed the, the Native American art exhibit. We, we, we witnessed some of the European sculptures and paintings uh, by, by painters like the, like the Caravaggio and, and several af- pieces of African art and pottery, some of them thousands of years old. And all of these pieces were available, and they still are available for, for virtual tour. But I'll tell you something. Having visited and seen them in person was a completely different experience because there were just some things that didn't translate the same from a photographed image. The paint, the little ridges of paint on the paintings that almost have a 3D effect, the tiny imperfections that you see on the sculptures that you know have traveled from continent to continent over the centuries. Even the sound of a person walking down the hall only to stop in sheer silence. And although you cannot see them, you know that they are sitting or standing and looking at a piece of art in awe. It's not just the art itself, but it's our presence with and among the art. It's not just the silence itself, but it's our presence with and among the silence. Something mysterious about that and being physically there. Virtual museums are convenient, but deep down I think we know that they're they're, They're not the ideal. And the same with community. It's kept us from being disconnected for so long, and it has kept us longer than we've anticipated. And for many of us, longer than we would like. And I get a sense that so many of us are longing for more. Something about that presence together. And that's why we get so excited about things like Advent, which is coming up beginning next week, and about eventually getting to Christmas, because that's all about a God who kind of is virtual and then comes in person. (laughs) 
And so we as a church can identify with that in a deep way that we may not have identified in years and times past. And so for now, for some of us, virtual is our only reality. But even then, a small reach out or a touch, a handwritten note, a way of saying, even if I can't be with you, I remain connected with you, serves as a reminder that, yes, those who cannot be here in person, too, are also a part of the body of Christ. And so renewing life together means that we commit. We commit to showing up with one another and for one another. It means that we commit to being formed together in community as guided by the Holy Spirit. Renewing life together means that we return back to the table, the place where we are all equal, the place that we find our commonality and our humanity, the place where we find ourselves all needing to eat and to drink and all needing community. We return to the place where social status and wealth and prominence is leveled and where those of us who have been exalted are brought low and those of us who have been brought low are exalted and we sit equal at the table. It is the body of Christ. And so I invite you this morning, <laughs> this time it's okay, <laughs> to take of the elements that you have. With the bread and the cup, and as you open it, and as you are opening that and preparing, I, I just want to ask you a question to consider what gifts, what abilities, perhaps what presence do you sense that God is calling and guiding you into this season as you consider who you are in the body of Christ? And so on the night that he was betrayed, he took of the bread. And after having blessed it, he broke it and said to his disciples, this is my body given for you. Take and eat of it. And then, after they had eaten of the bread, he took of the cup. And he shared with them, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. It will be for the remission of sins for many. Take and drink of it, all of it. 